welcome to Science Views from the Valley. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Kassan. Science Views from the Valley is a monthly program that will explore interesting science topics and how they relate to the San Luis Valley and the Upper Rio Grande region. Good morning on this chilly Thanksgiving day. Today, while your turkey is being prepared for a lovely family dinner, I would like to talk about turkey biology, their history, and the different myths surrounding turkeys. Turkeys belong to the order Galliformes, a group of large ground-feeding birds that also include chickens, quail, and pheasants. Genetic data indicates that the nearest living relative to the wild turkey is the grouse and prairie chicken. Several species of turkeys have lived in North America since the Pliocene, but only two species of turkeys exist today. The oscillated turkey, Meliagris oscillata, lives in the Yucatan Peninsula, Belize, and Guatemala, and the wild turkey, Meliagris galapavo, found in the U.S. and Canada and in northern Mexico. The turkey you are eating later today is a domesticated variant of Meliagris galapavo. This species was first domesticated by the Mayans approximately 2,000 years ago. Early Spanish explorers in Mexico collected some of the specimens of this turkey and brought them back to Europe where they became very popular in farmyards. When Europeans began to colonize the U.S. and Canada, they brought these domestic turkeys with them, returning them to their ancestral native land. Currently, the wild turkey is seen in all 50 states, southern Canada, and northern Mexico, though they are found in much greater numbers in the Midwestern states and in the Eastern states. The wild turkey, Meliagris galapavo, is a large, dark-colored bird with extreme sexual dimorphism. Females are much smaller than the males. Female wild turkeys weigh approximately 5.5 pounds to about 12 pounds. Males, however, which are called toms or gobblers, can weigh as much as 24 pounds. This weight range makes the wild turkey the second heaviest North American bird behind the trumpeter swan. Despite their heaviness, wild turkeys are agile flyers that can fly close to the ground. Male turkeys have brightly colored heads with a fleshy wattle called a snood. The snood is an indicator of health. If the male bird is infected with internal parasites, the snood will be shorter. Female hens, therefore, are more attracted to the healthy males with longer snoods. Mating with males that indicate a greater health increases the health and longevity of their young. Male turkeys also have brightly colored feathers of iridescent green, red, purple, copper, browns, and gold. Their featherless heads are a mix of red, white, and blue. Male turkeys also have a tuft of thin feathers called a beard on his chest. The male has pink or gray legs with upwardly curved spurs, and these spurs are used by males to achieve dominance over other males. Female turkeys, called hens, are mostly brown, gray, and white. Approximately 1% of hens will have a beard like the males, though this is mostly seen in the populations in the eastern U.S. Turkeys have many different vocalizations that are used to communicate with other turkeys within their group. Though the turkey is most represented by the gobble, both males and females are known to produce over 30 different types of vocalizations, including yelps, clucks and purrs, putts, cuts, whines, cackles, and kikis. The yelp <laughs> is the most common turkey vocalization, which may be used to announce their location to other turkeys in their family group. Another turkey vocalization is the cluck. which is used to get the attention of other turkeys. 
The putt is a staccato sound used as an alarm to other turkeys in the group. According to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, male and female turkeys will cackle as they fly up and down from their roosts. Turkeys will also produce short purring sounds <laughs> while traveling on foot and during feeding, usually made by turkeys that are content, much like a cat will purr when it is content. The kiki sound <laughs> is produced when a turkey is lost from its family group, particularly juvenile turkeys. Wild turkeys prefer hardwood and mixed conifer hardwood forests dotted with pastures, fields, and marshes. Like chickens, turkeys have poor eyesight at night. When the sun begins to set, most turkeys will begin to roost in trees far above the ground to reduce predation risk. Predators of wild turkeys include raccoons, possums, skunks, snakes, and the gray fox. Wild turkeys will also roost in large conifers to protect them from winter storms. Most of the year, female turkeys live in family-like groups consisting of other females and their young. Male turkeys live in bachelor groups until about February or March when they begin to mingle with the female's family groups. The male will produce a distinct gobbling call <laughs> to attract females and to warn off other male turkeys. So among wild turkeys, it appears that females are attracted to the toughest sounding male. After the male attracts a female, he will then display to the female by fanning his tail vertically and strutting while making humming and chump sounds. The male will also vibrate their fan tails rapidly while their facial colors, the red, white, and blue, intensify. Male wild turkeys are polygamous, mating with many females before joining an all-male bachelor flock outside of the breeding season. Female turkeys will build a nest in a shallow depression in the soil using leaves and other plant material. They can lay anywhere from 4 to 17 eggs per brood. Turkey eggs hatch in approximately 25 to 31 days. The hatchlings, called pouts, are precocial, meaning that they are able to walk and feed soon after hatching. Other poultry, Chickens, ducks, and quails also have precocial hatchlings. Poults grow extremely quickly. Though they average only 1.6 ounces when they hatch, they will gain over a pound in a month. The females care for their young within a large family group, often containing two or more adult females with their young. Though poults are protected by several females in these family units, only 25% on average will live more than one month due to the high predation on the young. So what do turkeys eat? Turkeys are omnivores, preferring to feed on a variety of plant material like acorns, nuts, seeds, and berries. But in the late spring and summer, when the females are rearing their young, they will complement their vegetarian diet with salamanders, snails, and insects. Like most birds, which lack teeth, turkeys will also swallow gritty material like sand to help them digest their food. Because of their poor night vision, turkeys feed during the day. The lifespan of a wild turkey is quite short only three years for hens and four years for toms. Hens live a shorter life in large part due to predators as the hens try to protect their poults. The environment also plays a role in a turkey's life expectancy. 
If the turkey's environment is low in resources, then a turkey will need to roam a much greater distance to obtain what they need. This exposes the turkeys to a much greater predation risk. In the early 1900s, wild turkey populations had drastically declined due to hunting and deforestation. By the 1930s, turkey populations, which had once ranged in the millions, were reduced to approximately 30,000 individuals in the U.S. and were nearly extinct in Canada. Efforts to hand rear poults and release them into the wild failed in large part because the poults imprinted on their human caretakers. Imprinting involves young animals, particularly birds, to prefer the first object it sees and is regularly exposed to, usually its parent. Imprinting in turkeys occurs within the first hours of hatching and remains permanent. So hand-reared wild turkeys would imprint on humans and could not survive in the wild. Individuals from turkey populations that experienced a surplus would be captured and moved to an unoccupied territory. This not only produced new wild turkey populations, but also ensured that the turkey populations had adequate resources to survive and grow. This plan worked very well, and by 1973, the turkey population in the U.S. was estimated to be 1.3 million. Canada, where the turkey populations were extirpated, traded moose for wild turkeys in 1935 and again in 1985. Six subspecies of wild turkey exist in the U.S., but only two are seen in Colorado. One is the Rio Grande turkey, Meliagris gallopevo intermedia. This subspecies is especially adapted to prairie habitats, having longer legs than other turkey subspecies and body feathers that are more green and copper, making it easier for the turkeys to hide in the tall grass. The Rio Grande turkey prefers to live in brushy areas near streams and rivers or in mesquite, pine, and scrub oak forests. The other subspecies seen in Colorado is Miriam's wild turkey. This turkey is seen mainly in the Rocky Mountains, preferring a habitat that consists of ponderosa pine and high altitude. Miriam's wild turkey differs from the Rio Grande turkey in its coloration which has more white on their tails and lower back. The male beard of this species is also shorter than that of the Rio Grande turkey. The second surviving species of wild turkey is the oscillated turkey, Meliagris ocellata. This species is much smaller than the wild turkey. Adult hens weigh an average of 8.8 .8 pounds, while the males can reach 11 to 13 pounds. This turkey is found primarily in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and is a major part of the diet of the people in this region. The oscillated turkey has feathers of bronze and iridescent green color. The tails are long and are blue-gray in color with many spots that resemble eyes. Oscillated turkeys are called oscillated due to these blue-bronze spots, which are also called ocelli, on their tails. The heads of the oscillated turkey are blue with orange nodules. Oscillated turkeys also lack the beard seen in the male wild turkeys in the U.S. Like the wild turkey, the oscillated turkey is a ground feeder that will roost in trees to avoid predators, especially the jaguar. The courtship behavior of the oscillated turkey is also quite different from that of the wild turkey, involving feet tapping, moving the tail from side to side, and vibrating their wings as he moves around the female. The gobble sound of the oscillated turkey is also different. The male wild turkey gives a gobble that sounds like this, <coughs> while the gobble of the oscillated turkey sounds like this. The oscillated turkey is more omnivorous than the wild turkey.
Like the wild turkey, oscillated turkeys will feed on a variety of plant matter, but they will also eat beetles, moss, and leafcutter ants. The male oscillated turkey are seen in groups of no more than three mature males, while the female family groups can consist of eight or more yearling turkeys and hens. Oscillated turkeys are not as vocal as their northern relatives. Wildlife biologists believe this may be due to the high number of predators found in their region. Along with the jaguar, gray fox, margay cats, ocelots, raccoons, coatis, cougars, snakes, and birds of prey are all known to prey on the oscillated turkey. Due to this high predation rate, the survival rate of the female oscillated turkey is 25 to 40 percent, while juvenile oscillated turkeys is 15 percent or less. Quiet turkeys are less likely to be detected by predators, but male and female oscillated turkeys are known to produce a nasal cluck putt location call, which can be made louder to serve as an alarm call to other turkeys. The oscillated turkey were greatly prized for their iridescent feathers. Ancient Mayans traded oscillated turkeys for northern wild turkeys, which the Mayans then domesticated. Both turkey species were eaten, sacrificed, and worshipped by the Mayans. But the oscillated turkey populations are currently in decline due to subsistence hunting by the local people and habitat loss. The slash and burn clear cutting that is occurring in tropical forests leave the oscillated turkey with few places to roost safely. Oscillated turkey populations in Guatemala and Belize are currently protected in private and national reserves. Though the Thanksgiving tradition includes turkey, the story that the Native Americans had introduced turkey to the pilgrims is a myth. In reality, Spanish explorers had brought wild turkeys back to Europe, where colonists began to farm and eat them. Turkey had been on the English menu as early as 1550. Benjamin Franklin was said to have promoted the wild turkey as the national symbol of the U.S. This story, however, is a myth. Benjamin Franklin had written a letter to his daughter Sarah criticizing the design of the great seal that represented the U.S., stating that it looked more like a turkey. Benjamin Franklin also wrote that the turkey was a more respectable bird than the bald eagle. He stated in his letter that the turkey was a bird of courage that would not hesitate to fight invaders to its territory. The bald eagle, Franklin wrote, was a bird of bad moral character that steals fish from the fishing hawk because it was too lazy to fish for itself. Though Franklin was asked for his ideas on how to design the great seal, his suggestions were more biblical, suggesting instead that an image of Moses standing on the shore, extending his hand over the seas, along with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. The wild turkey, however, is a prominent symbol among Native American tribes in North America. Some tribal leaders, like the Catawba, would wear headdresses made from turkey feathers. High-ranking individuals among the Muscogee Creek and the Wampanoag tribes wore turkey feather cloaks. The turkey dance is an important dance among the Caddo tribe in the southeastern U.S., primarily in eastern Texas and Louisiana. Traditionally, the women dance while the men drum and sing songs describing their history. The turkey dances are ancient and were performed long before the Spanish missionaries arrived in the 18th century. The origin of the turkey dance is unclear, but one story states that a Caddo man, while hunting in the forest, heard singing. The man went over to investigate and found several turkey hens dancing around a tom turkey. The hunter memorized the steps and shared it with his tribe. The dance has several rules. One is that the dance must be completed by sundown. Male drummers set the rhythm of the first song as the women dancers approach the dance area. The women will then dance in a circle, kicking the dirt as a turkey would. 
The men continue to drum and sing as the women start the second phase of the dancing, which involves a sidestep that mimics turkey hens hunting for seeds in the dirt. In the third phase of the dance, the women swarm the male drummers in the middle of the dance floor, mimicking the turkey hens that surround a male turkey that is strutting and vocalizing. Then the men and the women pair off for the victory phase of the dance as the sun sets. The Cato turkey dance is still performed today. The Aztec god of disease and plague, Chalchitatolan, could shapeshift into a turkey. This god was a patron of the jaguar warriors of the night and would cleanse the warriors of contamination and absolve them of their guilt. Chalchitatolan was also a trickster who played the flute to lead people astray. If someone was lucky enough to see and take hold of him, that person would be granted a wish. The ancient Mayans also worshipped the turkey. They believed that the turkey possessed exceptional powers and could be harmful to humans from dream space. Live turkeys were sacrificed to promote a fertile new year as they were viewed as stand-ins and messengers of the Mayan gods. So now that you have learned a little bit about turkey biology, history, and mythology, let's move on to astronomical events. There will be a total solar eclipse on December 4th. Unfortunately, we will not be able to see it here in Colorado. In fact, other than scientists living in Antarctica and people living on islands in the southern Atlantic, no one will be seeing this total eclipse. The next solar eclipse that can be viewed in Alamosa, Colorado, will be a partial solar eclipse on October 14, 2023. If you drive to Durango on that day, you may be able to see the ring of fire that is characteristic of an annular eclipse, since the Four Corners region of Colorado is within the path of the annular solar eclipse. So what is the difference between a total, annular, and partial solar eclipse? A solar eclipse occurs because the moon comes in between the sun and the earth, casting the moon's shadow on the earth. The moon's orbit is tilted slightly to the earth's orbit around the sun, which is why we do not have solar eclipses every month. When the moon is at a distance that makes it smaller than the apparent size of the sun, but is exactly in line with the earth and the sun, then we observe an annular eclipse with its characteristic ring of fire. When the moon is not exactly in line with the earth and the sun's orbit, then we observe a partial eclipse. Think of it this way. When you are out in bright sunlight, you place your hand between the sun and you. This blocks enough of the direct rays to allow you to see in the direction of the sun more easily. If your hand was smaller than the apparent size of the sun in the sky, you would see your hand with a ring of sunlight around it. This would be like an annular eclipse. If you move your hand so it only blocked part of the sun, then some of the sunlight would still reach you. This would be similar to a partial solar eclipse. One of the best annual meteor showers will peak on December 13th and 14th. This meteor shower is the Geminids, and it is the result of debris left by the asteroid 3200 Phaeton, an Apollo asteroid. Apollo asteroids are those that cross the Earth's orbit. Another Apollo asteroid was the cause of the Chelyabinsk meteor that exploded over Russia in 2013, injuring 1,500 people from flying debris from broken windows and damaging everything on the ground within 100 kilometers. 3200 Phaeton is listed as a potentially hazardous asteroid because it can cross the Earth's orbit. But never fear, this asteroid is not expected to cross the Earth's orbit for at least 400 years. Another meteor shower will peak on December 21st. These are the Ursid meteor showers, but this shower is a minor shower. It is hard to see as it consists mainly of dust particles left by the comet 8P Tuttle, a short period comet that comes near the sun every 13.6 years. This comet last passed the Earth just a short while ago 
on August 27, 2021. I would like to thank everyone for listening to my discussion on turkeys. I hope you found this topic informative. If you have a question or a topic you would like to hear discussed on this show, send me an email at spiderwomankrza at gmail.com. If you would like to hear my past shows, they are archived on YouTube at Science Views from the Valley, Alamosa, CO. Next month's show will be on December 23rd, when I will discuss the American chestnut and the tragedy that occurred to this magnificent tree. I would like to thank everyone here at KRZA for their help in developing this show. Have a happy Thanksgiving.